my face. Hello! <laughs> Hi everybody, how are you today? Um, I am very well. I'm warm again in my office. Sorry, I'm just going to be changing um, changing screens. I realized yesterday that my eyes are darting all over the place. So if you are watching live, please drop me a comment and say hello. And if you are watching on replay, I would love for you to also say hello, um, because whether you're watching live or on replay, um, it's a pleasure to have you here. So welcome. Right, everybody, I am going to get started. First of all, welcome back. <laughs> you made it. Thank you so much for joining me yesterday, either live or, or, or on replay, um, and also today. So welcome back to day two of our um, workshop series this week. So how is everybody feeling? Are you feeling like me? Um, oh, hi, Kate. <laughs> nice to have you here. Are you feeling like me in this photo? Super excited, super motivated. Got some great comments yesterday about feeling inspired and just feeling some of that weight lift off um, our shoulders, um, which is exactly what we want to do, because if we're all burdened down, um, no action is going to take. Or are you feeling like me here? This is a classy, uh, a classy photo. This was me, peak second lockdown, peak homeschooling, peak winter. Um, as you can see, I'd probably eaten way too much chocolate over the Christmas break. I'm pretty certain the kids had just broken me. I feel like I was hanging up washing and I was just as low as it gets. And I wanted, it's kind of weird to take a photograph of yourself when you're like this, but I just wanted to capture that there's always a balance and there's always like feeling down and feeling up. Um, so uh, were, are you either one of those two or probably much more um, uh, healthy and sane and balanced, which was the word from yesterday, by like this. Cautious, I'm taking it all in, I'm hopeful, but I'm not gonna, I'm not going in all guns blazing. I'm, I'm not thinking that everything's amazing, but I equally, I'm not gonna let everything depress me. So hopefully we are all feeling a bit more like this. So I am just going to turn off my video. I will see you shortly, hang on. Let's go to this fella. Right, okay, here we go. So recap from yesterday. Um, what did we go through? We said, it's okay to feel how we're feeling. It's not okay because the um, it would be better if the environment was in a much better state, but we understand why we accept our feelings. We know that other people feel like that and we know why we're feeling that. So that's okay, that's our first step. A key to improving our anxiety and our overwhelm is to learn more and that's what you guys are here for. That's hopefully the um, sort of journey that I'm sort of starting you down, that you're tiptoeing around um, and you're getting yourselves informed. I'm informing myself. We talked a lot yesterday about balance. So we talked about learning more, educating ourselves, but not feeling overwhelmed. We talked about doing action, but not trying to do it all. So it's always this balance, always this juggle. And by sort of keeping that balance, um, that's how we can move forward. We, we talked about taking action and how when we take action, that drives hope. But back to the balance, if we try and do it all, if we try and take too much action all in one go, um, we're going to get overwhelmed. So little action, one at a time, things that we can manage, um, and that will drive our hope. We are going to focus on the positive, both on our own actions and in the news. And we are going to realize that we are not on our own. We are all in this together. We all care and we are all driving forward. And finally, we are going to be gentle. That's with ourselves and with, us, with others. We are going to not expect everything from us and what we do. But equally, we are not going to judge other people um, and the steps that they are either taking or not taking. Because, and this is one of my favorite quotes, as you guys know, and I think it resonated with you. Hang on. Oopsie. Do not, we are not going to feel guilty for a supply chain we did not create. Now, that does not mean that we shouldn't be doing anything, that we shouldn't be taking action, that we shouldn't be moving forward and um, caring and acting. But 
we are not going to take the whole burden of the whole supply chain and the impact it has on the environment onto our shoulders alone. OK, we're not going to do that. Um, and yeah, so that that's a recap from yesterday. Also, remember this to get the most from these sessions. Pretend you've paid for them. You've blocked out the time. Show up. Listen participate, take away actions. Now that doesn't have to be live, but please put the time aside in your diary for early morning, evening, at the weekend, whenever you have time, sit down, take an hour, go through, listen, see what resonates, try and have your aha moments, try and take away some actions. Please note down any questions. Tomorrow is our question and answer question and answer session um, but any questions that pop up I can answer on the fly Kate yes I agree that reminder sorry for the previous slide it's great reminder isn't it I think certainly the, those of us who are um, sort of very eco inclined and try and do our best all the time as we all do so that's the, those of us here um, yeah I think sometimes we forget that we didn't make this um, supply chain we're just trying to fix it and finally bring your best energy as I said alone it is overwhelming but together we can do this we really really can so um that's how you get most from the um the sessions I'd like to kick off with um a great quote from Maya Angelou and I love this one do the best you can until you know better then when you know better, do better. Now, I love this quote because I think it really strikes a balance. And again, that word is cropping up between being kind to ourselves and not putting too much guilt, too much burden on our shoulders. But at the same time, it challenges us to A, keep learning um, and B, once we've learned, keep doing, keep acting, keep moving forward, keep doing better. So I absolutely love this. And I really hope that this quote um, sort of is really relevant to um, these workshops over the, um, uh, to, like these, these few days. <laughs> right, workshop two, what are we going to cover? So basically, it's going to be two different um, areas that we're going to be looking at. The first is our environmental footprint. And the second is about imperfectly, e I see, <laughs> imperfectly eco. I've even been imperfect on this slide. Imperfectly eco is perfect. And it does have a positive footprint, not have, have a positive impact. So our environmental footprint. Why does it matter? Now, yesterday I started um, the workshop with a, um, a little YouTube video and I would like to do one now. So I am just going to stop that. Hello again. <laughs> and now I'm going to choose instead. Hang on. Let's see if I can find it. Move that date. OK, so this, guys, this is why we are doing it. Let's just see if I'm sharing this. I am awesome. All right, let's go. Right. OK, that is obviously a super powerful, emotive, short little movie yet. Um, and, um, you know, we know the style, but I think it makes a really important point. We have fought for so much, but fundamentally, if we you know, if we're thinking about Maslow, oopsie, sorry, <laughs> if we're thinking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, 
first of all, we need a place to live. So that is why we are doing what we are doing. And that is why we are caring and learning about um, the impact that we have on this world and how to lighten that load. So I am going to switch back to the slides. Excuse me. <laughs> okay. And I think we are back. Lovely. Okay, fantastic. I'm just going to pop that down there so I can see. Okay. So what is an environmental footprint? The Cambridge Dictionary defines it as the effect that a person, a company, an activity has on the environment. For example, the amount of natural resources that they use and so that's what we take and the harm or the amount of harmful gases they produce. So when we're talking about an environmental footprint, this is what we are talking about. How much resources do we use or how many resources do we use? And what are the byproducts? What are the harmful gases that we as individuals, companies um, or a particular activity? What does that produce? Now, this is another um organization another website i've put the url up there and this is linked to um that overshoot day video that i just showed you just now um and this is i put this up there up here because i think sometimes we always talk about the um the footprint like the impact that we're having but we actually don't talk about what are our resources um and um like what's there for us to use. So for example, in the, we can see in this slide, it says the ecological footprint measures how fast we consume resources and generate waste compared to how fast nature can absorb our waste and generate new resources. So this ecological footprint measures um, the demand on and the supply of nature. On the demand side, it adds up all the productive areas um, for which a population, a person on a, or a product compete, so that they, they need. Um, and it measures the ecological assets that a given population or a product needs um, to produce the natural resources it consumes. Now, this could be plant-based food, it could be um, fiber products such as paper, wood, etc., livestock, fish, um, and also how much, how like how much resources does it need to absorb the waste, especially carbon emissions? Okay, and then on the supply side, it's basically um, a biocapacity. So, what are the natural resources that exist if they are left unharvested that can absorb our waste, absorb our gases? So it's really not just what we use and the waste we generate, but what can the natural world um, sort of like um, regenerate? OK, so a bit more complex, but, you know, give and take supply and demand. OK, so why is it important? Nice little uh, footprint slide there. OK, another quote from the fantastic Jane Goodall. You cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of a difference you want to make. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. We just we can't get away from the fact that just by living, just by existing, just by wearing clothes, eating food, living in a house, participating in our daily activities, we are having an impact on the world around us. And we have to decide what type of an impact we want to have. Do we want to have a really heavy uh, negative impact or do we want to have a lighter impact? Do we even want to have a positive impact? Are there things that we can do to um, like have a positive impact on the world? I'm just gonna take a sip of water. Okay. Now, I showed a video just back here, um, and that was produced by um, uh, an organization, a campaign called World Overshoot Day. Does anyone know what World Overshoot Day is? Um, and secondly, does anyone know what um, 
day, World Overshoot Day, is this year. You saw a bit of a clue in the video, um, but um, it's not always the same. So does anybody know what it is? And does anybody know the date for this year, 2021? So I'll just give you a minute, because I know that there is this time delay. Okay, thank you. The point where we've used up our natural resources per capita. Yes, and you're right. It is around July this year. Um, I am going to go to the next slide, and I think I wrote it down on the next slide. Yes, 29th of July. So last year, which was 2020, it was August the 22nd. This year, because everything is back up and running a bit more, it's July the 29th. Um, so I believe it's like that we would need the amount of resources that exist in the world. We would need 1.7 worlds per, um, you know, to, to, to provide the resources that the whole um, world population needs. So I am just going to show you a, another quick video. Um, it's um, from 2017. So it's a few years old and it is also um, sort of, US based and also for um, like secondary school aged kids. Um, but I thought it was really good way of explaining it. <laughs> and I really liked it. So I, ho I hope you do too. So give me a second. I'm going to um, appear again. Hello. And I am then going to disappear in a second. I, once I've got this. Okay, here we go. Right. I have disappeared. I'm opening that back up. And let me just check that you can see that as well. Yes, you can. Right, I'm going to go. More than 80% of people in the world today live in countries that demand more from nature than their ecosystems can regenerate. Their country's ecological budgets are in the red. We know this from ecological footprint accounting. The ecological footprint measures human demand on nature and can be compared to biocapacity, which is the productivity of a region's ecological assets. China has the largest total ecological footprint, making up nearly 24% of the world's total ecological footprint. However, China's footprint per person is only 3.6 global hectares. By comparison, the footprint per person of the United States is much larger at 8.6 global hectares. Brazil, meanwhile, has an ecological reserve thanks to its immense forests. Brazil has a biocapacity per person of nearly 8.9 global hectares and a footprint per person of 3 global hectares. Carbon emissions are the largest component of the ecological footprint. The footprint also includes consumption of food, timber, fiber such as cotton, and use of land for cities. Global Footprint Network calculates the footprint of more than 200 countries and regions from 1961 to the present. Find out if your country's ecological budget is in the red. Visit our Footprint Explorer open data platform at data.footprintnetwork.org. Now, I love that. As I said, it's um, very um, simple and straightforward. But I think for me, when I saw that, I thought, right, I really understand because like I was saying a few slides ago, we we tend to talk about our output. We tend to talk about our waste and our um, gas output. We don't really think about what's kind of feeding um, what we're consuming, what we're buying, what we're using. Um, and the, the fact that I think also that the we sometimes just don't think that the world can sustain us. And I think that um, contributes to this feeling of hopelessness. But it can if we use the resources in the right way. And um, yeah, again, I just think it's really something really useful to keep at the back of our minds in terms of let's consume less, but 
maybe let's also try and help our um, biodiversity and our sort of our natural habitat um, recover and just not take so much. I think it was David Attenborough who sort of said, you can live how you want to live, but just don't waste. And I think a lot of waste um, really contributes to us using more than we actually need. Right, okay, I am going to say farewell again. I am going to go back to our slides. Okay, that is all that. Let's get you down here. Right, okay, my impact. What impact do I, as a, an individual, not just a, um, at a country population level, what do I, uh, the, what, what impact do I have on the world around me and um, the environment? So, Last night, I set you guys some homework. I know, homework. Who expected homework from some free workshops? I don't know if you guys um, did that yet. If not, um, don't worry. Um, but do head to um, so the Facebook group. I have posted um, like this, this um, WWF footprint calculator. But there are there is also... Um, about three others that we've posted in the chat. There was a, a chat that came up in terms of understanding um, your footprint um, and then like sort of playing around with it. So I will, I'm going to go through some of this um, stuff, some of the other calculators, but the general advice um, and the general way that I look at it and I think about it is I I don't think any one particular carbon footprint or environmental footprint calculator can accurately give you um, an exact score about what you um, are doing and the, the impacts that you're having. I think these tools are very useful just to um, use as um, a form of guidance. And I think you kind of pull from different resources and just generally use them as tools to have a think about what could I do better? Um, what are some of the quick wins that I can make changes to in my life that are going to have a, a sort of high impact? But, uh, you know, let's start with the easiest ones first. But you know, it, it's, it's, it's all good information. So um, in terms of this one, the WWF, um, what is meant by a carbon footprint? Well, what these guys say, um, it, we've talked earlier on about carbon fo um, environmental footprints in general, is your footprint is a way of showing your carbon emissions. And it's also um, carbon, often carbon equivalent. Oh, here you go. By carbon um, emissions, we mean greenhouse gases. So it's not just carbon. So it's carbon emissions compared to other people and other countries. It's the impression that you have on the planet. And it includes all greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. We produce these um, in vast quantities by burning coal, oil, and gas for energy and cutting down forests. Um, and your individual emissions are built up from the energy you use personally um, for um, in your home and also for travel, and also the energy that's required to produce your food and the other stuff you buy. So we sometimes think of um, carbon emissions as just being, well, how much do I drive my car? Or what, what's the electricity that I use in my house? But it's also everything. Um, and you need to think about when whether stuff's made in the UK or elsewhere, and um, sort of the, the carbon cost of A, creating that good, uh, that, that, that product, and B, bringing it to you. Right, so in this particular um, calculator, what does the result mean? So in the WWF one, once you've answered the questions, you'll see a percentage score. 100% is the average for each UK city, citizen being on a trajectory to hit zero footprint, zero carbon footprint by 2045. So if you hit 100%, you are on target for hitting that zero footprint. If you are more than 100%, you know you can do more. And if you are under 100%, um, you know, keep doing what you're doing and help others, inspire other people to do the same, but keep 
cutting keep sort of um trying to reduce even further you know you can set yourself a little target right okay next slide so mine my carbon footprint is 83 percent of my target impact um compared to the uk average so i'm doing pretty well i think some of the reason for that is that we have 100% green electricity supplying our home. Um, I also um, pay an additional supplement for the gas to offset our gas emissions for the gas that we use. We also have solar panels on our um, house. We had those installed in January. Very exciting to see the sun charging. And I know that we can't use it all because we, we didn't buy the battery system, but I love the fact that that is green energy going back onto the grid. So you guys can share it. <laughs> like I said, I can't remember if it was yesterday or today. I said, I think it was yesterday about sharing my belief. You can share my electricity. I'm putting it onto the grid for you. Um, and there's loads of different um, uh, energy providers that, can, that do um, green energy. There is some discussion around um, whether they are just providing green tariffs just by offsetting or actually buying green energy. But I still think, back to our next section, um, I think imperfect is perfect. I think even if we're imperfect, we are signaling to the market that this is where we want to go. Um, food, we have a very low meat diet. We could probably do much better on dairy, but we are getting there. Um, and then our stuff, we don't buy tons of stuff. But for example, I needed a new computer um, uh, because the other one just ground to all. It, it was pushing 10 years old. Um, but that has an impact. The size of your TV has an impact. So I'm, I'm doing OK, but I think that we need to just keep driving that number down. Right. Your plastic footprint. I thought this was very interesting to do. Um, there's an app. I don't. I think you could do it online, and um, or maybe it is just an app. I've downloaded the app. You find out what um, your plastic footprint is based on your um, the things in your house and your consumption, and you get a plastic mass index, um, which calculates your footprint. Um, basically, the closer to zero it is, um, the less you, uh, um, you're contributing to plastic pollution and the closer to 100, the more. So and then it gives you hints and tips to go on a plastic diet. <laughs> um, and it suggests different alternatives. So I think this is a lovely little app. Um, and you basically say what you're going to focus on, whether it's going to be the bathroom or the kitchen, and it will give you little swaps that you can make. So um, I think this is a really great app um, in terms of um, trying to reduce your plastic footprint. So in our um, Facebook group, um, I also gave links to um, a few other carbon calculators. Um, so I think it's really interesting. So this is one. Um, that I, and I've done all of them. So this one says my total carbon, um, or, you know, carbon equivalent output per year is about 10.66 tonnes. Now, if the average UK output um, is about 12 or 14 tonnes, possibly this is about right. I, you know, if it, um, it, you do need to have details of the amount of electricity and gas you use. So I had to go back into um, our account and find out how, how much we use per year and put that in. Um, it does also look at the impact um, under this secondary section of the things that you buy, the food, your clothes, your electronics, um, how much your mortgage costs. Um, and you have to put in a, a monetary amount um, and uh, that will give you um, yeah, they, it kind of works out the impact. Now, interestingly here, my it's saying the average footprint for people in the UK is 6.5 tonnes. Now, I think that's actually incredibly low. I don't know whether that's where we're meant to be aiming to, because um, it does say world target is two tonnes. Um, I don't know. Um, so I think perhaps the the footprint's about right. I think that I I think the country one is not necessarily right. This is another one, um, carbonindependent.org. Um, again, this is a bit easier to fill out. You basically sort of say how much you use different 
things, how much, like what, whether, whether you buy organic food, whether you um, buy local food, how much you use your car, etc. Uh, and it uses averages to calculate your um, sort of carbon output per, like, you know, ton output. It doesn't have an option for an electric car. Um, so yeah, this one, again, it's not perfect. My total, seven tons. So we've had um, 10 tons here. We've had seven tons here. It's saying the world average, the UK average is 14, which is around about what I've um, read. Um, but again, you, you can go and you can look and more, I know it's not showing on there. You can look more detail about sort of the different areas that are producing your carbon um, output. So again, have a play around with these. Finally, the footprint calculator, this is um, linked to the overshoot day, um, which is why it's showing that my own overshoot day is one day extra, um, uh, 30th of July. So my lifestyle is just a smidgen, it's a day better um, than the average um, world lifestyle. But we would need 1.7 Earths to, um, to sort of provide if everybody lived like me. And I think I live um, pretty um, eco-friendly. I'd like to think so. So um, you can see that it's uh, a bit of a task um, ahead of us. I like this one. It shows your, <coughs> excuse me, peanuts stuck in my throat, um, shows your impact by category. Um, and as you can see, we don't use our car very much. We live in suburban London. We walk pretty much everywhere. And when we do use it, it's electric and... <laughs> As most of you, we haven't been anywhere much over the past year. So our mobility category is the lowest of everything. Um, now, interestingly here, so my ecological footprint says I would need three hectares of um, land um, to produce the natural resources to support my lifestyle. And basically, we have enough, um, if you click on those um, information points, we have enough for 1.7 hectares of productive land per person. So I am using much more um, than, um, than the rest of the world, you know, than, than we actually have. My carbon footprint is four tons. So that is sort of more similar to the seven but it's not the 10. So you can see nothing is exact. But so I wouldn't take any one of these as sort of the gospel truth, but just um, as sort of signposts as to what type of impact your lifestyle is having and where you can um, make a difference. Right. But remember, so that's all a little bit like, ooh, but depressing, isn't it? You are all already addressing that impact. We talked about this yesterday. The five trees that are being planted um, have been planted um, in your name for uh, signing up and attending this workshop. Hopefully, your second part of your homework, you have installed Ecosia. So while you browse the, the web, whether it's on your phone or on your um, laptop desktop, you are planting trees. So you're already taking an, uh, having an impact. Remember your list. We talked about your list yesterday. All the things everybody is doing already to lighten their impact. Um, here, here are some of the things. So lots of people talked about less plastic, recycling, less meat, green cleaning, eating veg, less travel, etc. So it is not perfect and it is not enough. But it's OK. But like we are moving in the right direction. Secondly, we obviously need to apply pressure at a corporation and or governmental level, too. So this is why I keep talking about this um, course that I'll be going into more detail about next week and launches on the um, it starts on the 21st. One of the things that we will be offering, one of the sort of modules each week will be a template to lobby your MP or your council or your school or large corporations on a wide range of issues, um, be it plastic, be it biodiversity, be it climate change, be it zero waste. Um, so we can apply pressure, we can lobby, um, and it's not just down to us alone as individuals. We need to apply pressure and we can. All right. 
However, so we're doing stuff. We're going to try and um, put pressure on um, governments and um, corporations, but we must continue to lighten our footprints. So this is a bit um, in line with the quote that um, I put down from Jane Goodall, but this is specifically about money. Um, so every time you spend money, you are casting a vote for the kind of world you want. Now, just think about that. Every time you spend money, you are saying to a company, yes, I agree with, not only do I like the aesthetic of your products, I like how it looks, I agree with your um, the way you have created and um, produced this product and the way your company runs. I am going to give you my money and you are going to give me this thing. And that, you know, so every time you spend your money, you're casting a vote. So this is um, a really important thing to think about. Um, and I've, I've talked about this with um, Kathy from Miller and Keen. Um, and I think that, um, uh, I think Jen Gale and also um, Lauren Derrett talk about this, that um, we have great spending power. We can really make or break companies. We can really choose which companies succeed and which don't and we can make we can make a difference through what we where we spend and where we don't spend okay a quick game who has heard of how bad are bananas uh, it is an excellent book which i love and um, I talk about a lot and I kind of have as a little sort of a reference book on my desk and I sort of throw this information out um, and little key facts to my um, kids and my husband. Now, Kate, <laughs> I think you are the only one watching live. Everyone else watching on replay, you are going to have to, I think you can still play because you won't hear the answers um, until that I say them. So keep watching, do play on replay. I would love you to do so. Um, but Kate, it's you and I live. So we have talked about carbon um, footprints and tons of carbon that different products generate um, and, and, and that contributing to our footprint. So question for you. Bananas, how many kilograms of carbon or CO2 or CO2 equivalent, um, how many kilograms of, of um, carbon dioxide are produced per kilogram um, of bananas? So um, is it one kilogram of CO2 for one kilogram of bananas? Is it more than that? Is it less than that? What would your answer be? And I am going to wait because even if you're watching this on replay, I'm sure you can uh, have a guess. I'll give you a little clue. Bananas aren't that, aren't terrible. Um, they're not that bad. It's, it's a, a quick answer to <laughs> the question on the book. Less than a kilogram. Kate, you are correct. So you are right. So a banana is 0 0.7 kilograms of carbon or carbon or CO2 equivalent um, is produced per kilogram. Um, apples, what would you say for apples? And I want to know um, for local apples uh, and, and local to us and from New Zealand. What would you say the difference is? And while we're at it, I'm going to ask you a uh, another fruit based one. Grapes. And there's two different types. I want you to tell me on the road from Spain um, and air freighted from South Africa. Um, so we're looking at apples, per, local apples and New Zealand apples. So I'll give you the um, answer and then grapes on the road from Spain versus air freighted from South Africa. So the answer to the apples is locally produced apples are even better than bananas. They are 0.3 kilograms of carbon 
uh, CO2 um, equivalent produced per kilogram of apples. And even from New Zealand, it's only, but well, I say only, it's double. It's 0.6 kilograms of carbon produced per kilogram of apples. So um, local apples, much better than bananas. Um, New Zealand apples or apples from further afield, about equivalent. Now, the reason why apples and bananas have a relatively low carbon footprint is because they can be transported by sea. They're pretty hardy, they can be put into crates and they can be shipped, literally shipped, rather than flown. Um, and that means that there is, um, they have a, a much lower footprint than some other things. Even better if you grow your own, exactly, exactly. So your carbon footprint will probably be um, negative to, well, so it'll be um, neutral to um, positive if you grow your own because you are um, collecting all that carbon from the um, plants. Right, I am going to give you the answer to grapes. Um, and it'll be lovely if I could see um, some of the replay comments. I'll, I'll hop in and uh, see them as they come in. So grapes on the road from Spain per kilogram of grapes, they are going to produce 1.1 kilograms of um, CO2 or equivalent um, gas versus air freighted from South Africa, 18.5 kilograms. So for every kilogram of um, grapes from South Africa, 18.5 kilograms of carbon is produced. That's insane, isn't it? So my poor kids, <laughs> I'm now saying, when we go into the shops, I'm like, oh, so where are these from? So it's tricky. It's really, really tricky. And I think and we'll talk about being imperfect um, in, a, in a bit, but we can't be perfect. We didn't create this supply chain, but I think the more we learn, the, the, the more we can slightly navigate this. Now, question about 250 grams of cheese. So which has the highest footprint of 250 grams of cheese? Goat's cheese, cheddar, or Parmesan? So which has the highest carbon footprint, 250 grams of cheese? Is it goat's cheese, cheddar or parmesan? Again, I'll give you um, a minute or two to pop it in. Okay, so... For 250 grams of cheese, so this is a quarter of a kilogram, goat's cheese produces 1.6 kilograms of um, CO2. Cheddar produces almost twice that much at three kilograms. Ah, cheddar, Kate, that's your guess. So yes, you're right, cheddar is higher than, um, than goat's, but Parmesan, is 4.8 kilograms. Uh, in the in this book, I'm just gonna um, switch to me as well. I think this is over. Hello. So in this book, um, as well as talking about, um, now let's see if I can find the cheese bit. Um, as well as talking about, okay, I'll, I'm gonna pick a different example. As well as talking about the actual um, footprint, it also goes into the details because it's not super um, um, straightforward. So if you look here, whoopsie, see which way am I going? So for a latte, um, and it talks, you know, you've got your black tea, your tea with soy milk, your tea with cow's milk, et cetera, et cetera. And then it also goes into the details. Um, so for each of these things, this is a fabulous book. Um, and um, yes, and so it's not super straightforward, but you can find out how these are produced. But I just thought it was a, a fun game to have a go. I've got one more to go, so hang on there. Right, okay. Tomatoes versus steak. <laughs> now, um, we all know that eating less meat and specifically less red meat um, is better for the environment. So this is not, uh, um, yeah, this is just a bit of fun. 
tomatoes, so a kilogram of tomatoes versus eight ounces of steak, which has the highest footprint? Um, so you're going to buy your eight ounce of steak or you're going to have a whole kilogram of tomatoes. And you may have guessed it's not as straightforward. Um, uh, and this isn't me saying that we should all become um, red meat eaters. But I just want I, I just want a sort of final point in this um, game of uh, showing that things aren't straightforward. Right. I'm going to give you the answers. Right, so there are three types of tomatoes that they look at. Um, so for one kilogram of tomatoes, if you are buying the large salad variety, you know, the ones that um, our parents probably eat, grown locally in season, one kilogram of tomatoes produces 1.3 kilograms of CO2 or equivalent. Now, this bit really depressed me. Baby plum tomatoes, either um, produced in the UK summer or the Spanish winter. So if you're one kilogram of, of baby plum tomatoes, you are going to be producing 4.9 kilograms of CO2 or equivalent. Ah, so it's nearly five times as much. However, get this, it gets even more depressing. Um, organic vine cherry tomatoes heated in a greenhouse in the UK in March your carbon footprint for one kilogram of tomatoes is 28.2 kilograms, which is insane and depressing. Now your steak, as you, can, as you would imagine, it is higher. Um, per eight ounce steak, you are going, it's going to cost you 5.8 kilograms of carbon dioxide or equivalent if you get it from the UK. If you get it from um, deforested, so sorry, so my point is that is more than the um, large salad, locally grown tomatoes and the baby plum, but it is much less than your organic cherry, um, vine cherry tomatoes in March. So I'm not saying that everyone should not eat tomatoes and not eat um, uh, and to switch to <laughs> steaks from the UK, but it's not as simple as buying um, uh, buying and eating veg that isn't in season and isn't local because your footprint's higher. From deforest, deforested land in Brazil, your steak is going to cost 17.8 kilograms of carbon. And for beef, uh, and I'm not entirely sure why, I don't know whether that's because it, it's like a higher quality of meat, it's 24 kilograms. So it's a bit of a minefield, but I, and I, but I just wanted to kind of show that, um, yeah, it, it's something that we just have to learn about and kind of keep making the steps forward and it isn't as sort of super simple. Right, so how do we help us make these choices? How about the bananas, an amazing book. Um, I wonder whether I should include that in them. Um, well, I actually, I am. For in the course, this is one of the books that you can um, win when you sign up. I, I thought that I'd thought that it would be good for the course, so it's there. Who is going to help us make these choices? We know we need to make more informed choices. Who can help us? Right, there are two websites which I think are excellent. Um, so the first is The Ethical Consumer. It is subscription based. It's going to cost you about, I think it's 29, 29, 30 pounds a year to have access to this. But I think that is worth it. Um, and it basically has a whole range of sections, as you can see, energy, fashion, food, health, beauty, money, um, retailers. It, you know, for example, in the money, it talks about which banks are the best and pensions and mortgages, etc. Um, and I just chose an example from um, the high street fashion. And it basically ranks each of the different uh, companies on a series of categories. As you can see, the score is out of 20. Um, but you can, if you scroll down to the bottom, you can filter and say, I just care about the environment. Or I just care about people or animals and pot politics. And it will re-rank them. Um, so, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, I think it's really useful. It really helps you make some decisions about where you spend your money. 
So has anybody heard about B corporations? If not, so B corporations are um, companies who have gone through a pro process and have been um, certified to basically meet certain high standards and they are measured against social and environmental performance, public transparency, like how much do we have access to, how much can we see about their um, company, legal accountability. Um, and what they're trying to do and what the B Corporation organization is trying to do is redefine success in business and to really um, provide to show that, that to have a balance between profit and purpose and to show that um, governments and nonprofits alone can't change, can't solve um, our challenges and that um, companies have to be involved. But we want them to be ethical companies who are doing more good than bad. Um, and so I, I love this. Um, I love this um, setup. Um, and I love how the high standard that companies are held to um, to get their certification. Um, and so if you buy from a company who is a B Corp, you will know that they are basically trying to have a positive impact for their employees, for the communities around them, for the environment. They're working towards lower levels of in lower levels of inequality poverty, they they want a healthy environment, um, and they are going to create more high quality jobs. And it's really about using business as a force for good. So it's not all business is bad. Some businesses are good. And um, let's find them. So a bit like the ethical consumer website, you can search, and you can either do it by industry or country, or you could actually search um, for a particular company, and you can find out more about them and see um, who's there? Oh, hello, Kathy. <laughs> yes, I love it too. My aim for the contented company is to be certified, uh, be a certified B Corporation. I'm not yet there yet. I'm not um, really big enough to um, do that, but I keep having my eye on this. And this is one of my goals. I will be um, B Corp certified. I'm putting it out there. <laughs> right. Second part. Why imperfectly eco and why that's perfect so I just I, I basically think that none of it well I know none of us are perfect um, but I also think that this is a really good tool and I, I really think that it's I think it's a good thing so the why I think it's a good thing is when your friends and family um, know that they don't need to be perfect in order to make a difference they are going to be more likely to give sustainable living a try. They're going to be, they, they're going to think, oh, it's too much. I can't do this. Um, they're going to go like, okay, well, yeah, that seems, that seems like a small change. I can do that. I can incorporate that into my life. So I think by being imperfect, you're going to inspire more people to have a go. Um, and by saying you are 100% you're perfect now, that's essentially like a barrier to entry. You're giving people an unattainable goal um, that actually discourages. By being imperfect, you're saying, hey, this is within reach. You can do this. And so I don't want any of you to be perfect. I want you to be imperfect. <laughs> um, and we sometimes berate ourselves. We tell ourselves off for not making enough lifestyle changes. But we forget that the real goal, the real goal is system change. We didn't create the supply chain, did we? Um, it's not all on us as individual individuals. Um, it is on companies as well. And again, as I talked about the, the um, four-week course, that's why we're providing lobbying templates. Let's, let's do a pincer movement. Let's change what we do, but then let's put, put pressure on um, companies as well. And sustainability, sustainability shouldn't be about like total sacrifice. And we talked about this yesterday. We need to be internally um, sustainable as well as externally sustainable. Um, so we shouldn't be sacrificing everything, but we should make small positive changes and start thinking differently. We need to be thinking about um, like the long term goals. 
if we go in hard and fast, um, we're going to burn out. So if we look after ourselves and make those small steps, small changes one by one, um, we'll get there. If we go in hard and fast and burn out, we won't be able to achieve the very thing we're trying to do, <laughs> um, which is crazy. Um, so, and finally, we are all doing our best and that deserves to be praised. We really, we really should celebrate what we are doing. So, a quick exercise, okay? You can do this right now or you can do this tonight, tomorrow. Um, it's just something to think about in terms of helping you um, work out what you want to focus on. So, there is some debate about what the average um, output um, of CO2 is per year for the um, UK citizen. I'm going to go with this, 12.7 um, tonnes from the How Bad Our Bananas book. Um, and this is basically broken down into four areas. Food, about 25%. Home and accommodation is about 25%. Travel, 27 And everything else, 23 And as you can see, I've, you know, in the book, it breaks it down further. So from shops, it's 23%. And our eating out is two. In accommodation, we've got overnight accommodation, housing, fuel, electricity. And in travel, we've got fuel, the production of the car, the manufacturing, the flights, ferry crossings, and then in everything else, we've got non-food shopping, the services we buy, there's a few things missing there, health, education, and public services, but you get the drift. The, this is roughly um, where our um, carbon budget is spent. Um, in the How Bad Our Bananas book, um, Mike Berners-Lee says that we really need to be aiming for five tonnes instead of the, our 12 tonnes or or less <laughs> um, to be on track to um, be hitting zero. Right. So who has seen one of these before? Have you done this? We're not going to do this today. I will explain. So it's called the Wheel of Life and it is a visual tool. Um, which is used to um, assess and understand how balanced your life is. So this is often used um, in personal development courses um, and you score each area of your life on from one to 10 in terms of how well you think you're doing and you see how balanced it is and it can really help you um, understand where you're at and where you might want to focus. We are not going to fill this in today, um, but... I wanted to show this to you because I really think that um, it can help us when we're th like this type of mindset can help us when we're trying to work out where do we focus. So we need to pick our battles. It is OK to prioritize the parts of sustainability that light you up and you don't have to do it all. You don't have to do it all. Remember, we don't want to burden those shoulders back down, do we? We want to keep that burden, that guilt, that anxiety off and move forward um, with action. So in your workbooks, um, I've done like a sliding scale. Um, this is um, borrowed from the How Bad Our Bananas book. Um, and I want you to have a think about, put yourself on the scale and work out how you want to tackle your um, eco actions too. And you can also add in anything else if there's anything important to you. So do you want to save money or don't you mind about costs? Do you want to save time or for you, are you happy for this to take time? Do you want to get healthier while you're um, undertaking this action or do you want to look after your health separately? And do you want this to be a fun project um, or do you want this to be simple and easy? So score yourself on here and have a think about how you want to move forward and how you want to pick the battles um, that you want to do. And then have a look at your um, carbon footprints and think, well, which, which areas do I want to do? Knowing how I want to tackle them, what shall I tackle first? Okay, and Imperfectly Eco has an impact. So, Two graphs here, one is from the US, one is from the UK. It's about food um, uh, and the carbon footprint of food and different types of diets. So let's look at the um, US one, the more colorful one. If you are going from being a meat lover to no beef, so that's, you know, that's not no meat or no dairy. 
you're basically almost cutting your um, carbon output by a third. Okay, you're going from just over three to well, actually, just it's over a third, isn't it? Um, just over three to just under two tons of carbon output per year. If you go from your average to no beef, so that that also has an impact. And again, we've got it in um, pounds of CO2 because uh, we are UK. <laughs> um, and if we just look between heavy meat eaters, so 15 pounds per day, um, down to a low meat eater, 10 pounds a day. So just by cutting back and cutting down, you know, you're cutting off a third of your output. I mean, that's great. If you go down to pescatarians, if you just eat fish, and Kathy, I know there are sustainability issues around fish, but in terms of carbon output, um, you're almost at half of a heavy meat eater. And pescatarians and vegetarians, you're know, going from pescatarian to vegetarian, um, isn't that much difference now. There are huge sustainability issues around fish. So I'm not saying go out and buy and like switch everything to fish. We need to be think careful and, and very careful about what we consume. But if you just think by the time you're at sort of pescatarian or even low meat eaters to vegan, you're, you know, you're less than half. Um, so you're basically 60%. Vegans have a 60% output versus low meat eaters. Now, the further down the scale we can go, the better um, from a carbon output, from a biodiversity, from, you know, animal treatment uh, and, and everything. But you don't have to be perfect to have an impact. Now, there is also a shift towards green in politics. Now, the Green Party may not be in power, but these votes, the votes that do um, are made, apply pressure both to local and national governments. So if you look across, um, the Greens have the highest ever vote in London, um, highest ever vote um, in Wales, I can't say that. Please, any Welsh speakers, or um, please um, let me know. Drop me a, a, a DM or a voice note and let me know. <laughs> I'm not even going to attempt it. Now, yes, 99 seats gained across England and Wales. Um, in England, 85 seats. That's great. Look at that. Look at that increase. And then in London, with the mayoral vote, um, Sean Berry got was third place that they got nearly eight percent of the votes that's great and that applies pressure okay also things are changing it might not be at the speed we want it but they are Tesco's are removing plastic bags one billion pieces of plastic but since 2020 or in 2020 sorry animals are coming back um, in certain sea areas when there's been a ban on uh, fishing nets. We're trialling geothermal plants in the UK. Airbnb for gardens, connecting growers with green spaces. And even at a financial level, something that you don't really think about in terms of being green, um, depositors um, are demanding positive action from banks. So, um, we're, we're, we're wanting banks to, um, we're holding them to account um, in, on environmental impact in a way that they haven't been um, in the past. So quick recap, you didn't create the supply chain. So don't let that guilt weigh you down. However, we do all have an impact. So please know your footprint or know your version of different footprints so that you know where to tackle. Where is your footprint heaviest um, on the environment? Imperfect is perfect. It has an impact. It inspires. It shows that, that actions and um, living more sustainably is within reach. But pick your battles. Don't worry. Um, do what resonates with you. Do what inspires you pick the things that you can do and just take action and take that first step. So remember our prize. Okay. 
you can win the scholarship to the Just a Little Bit More Eco course, which starts on June the 21st. Scholarship to the Green Cleaning for Healthier Homes course, which will be in October. You can have 50 trees planted through Ecology and you can get a zero waste plastic free dental starter kit. Actually, do you know what? I'm going to come back. I'm going to say hi. I'm going to show you my lovely face. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, hi. Right, so how to enter, remember, please attend all three workshops, it can be live or on replay. Commit to eco action over eco overwhelm. That is the um, theme of um, these courses and I just really want to help you feel lighter and move forward. Please share your biggest light bulb moment from um, each workshop. I have posted um, a post on, um, in the Facebook group. Um, but those of you who don't um, use Facebook, just drop me an email and you can let me know. Um, and then a bonus entry, if you can share a selfie of you on whichever social media you use with a um, caption, overcoming my eco overwhelm. I did mine this morning, I'm, I'm not entering, um, with uh, reading my lovely Wilding book, this book here, um, outside, just taking a few moments, inspired by Kathy to be, um, uh, just grab some moments outside and in nature. And I will announce the winner by Sunday, um, this coming Sunday, the 13th. All right, what's next? So tomorrow is our last live workshop at 12. I will be answering any questions that you have. If you can't attend, please send me your questions ahead of time or do ask live. I'm gonna be going through some hints and tips and talking about what you can do next. And I'm going to end with the same last two slides as I did yesterday because I just think they have the perfect message. One, remember this, we don't need a handful of people doing zero waste or whatever sustainable living perfectly. We need millions of people doing it imperfectly. Imperfect is perfect. And let's be energized. What a great time to be born. What a great time to be alive because this generation this generation gets to essentially completely change the world. This is within our grasp. We can do it. I'm excited. I hope you are. Right. That's it. Thank you for joining. Sorry for running over again. Um, and I will catch up with you guys um, tomorrow and in the group. So take care. Have a wonderful, wonderful afternoon. And I will see you tomorrow. Bye.